Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. C.P. David. I'm a professor of geology and environmental science in UP Diliman. I'm also the current chairperson of the National Panel of Technical Experts of the Climate Change Commission. Together with the Oscar M. Lopez Center, we welcome everyone to this online forum on sea level rise entitled Taking Stock, Why uh, Should We Be Concerned About Climate and Sea Level Changes? As you can see, this is part one of two sessions that we are planning. Uh, the second one will be in September and I'll give you some more details about this second forum uh, after our session this morning. Before we formally start our program, may we just remind everyone of our house rules. First, push the talk. Sorry, someone's calling. Uh, kindly keep uh, your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. On your camera, please turn on your camera if you are speaking or asking questions. And um, you can send us your questions and feedback by using our chat box. Uh, raise your hand if you want to be acknowledged, and this is uh, going to be during our Q&A portion. And uh, last but not least, provide feedback using Zoom's participant icons. Okay. We shall also be recording the entire forum for documentation purposes only. Uh, and now let us all stand for the invocation and the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. children of the world, we are the hope of the future. But is there really a future for us and the next generation of children to come? It seems like the world is about to die on us. Father God, I play in the same field that my family plows, bountiful with crops because of the rivers that flow to water the land. Please let it remain so. If the rivers dry up, so will the fields. There will be no crops to harvest, no food to eat, and no more grasslands where we can play. Children as we may be, help us to protect our living environment, your beautiful creation. Dear Lord, the sea is where I love to swim, is also where my family catches fish to sell to the marketplace. You made the coral reefs that give food and shelter, a home to thousands of sea life. If we lose these corals, we lose not only the fish, but our way of life as well. Please help us and teach us to learn how to keep pollution out of our oceans and save the reefs that you have made for us to enjoy. Save us from the floods, spare us from the storms that leave children like us hungry and homeless and give more of your living water to drink. Pour out your love and kindness and rid the evil from this cruel earth. Lord, let me fly my kite on a windy day. I could ride a plane and go all over the world. That would be amazing too. Maybe one day that could happen when I grow up. But the clouds are thinning and there's global warming. What will happen to us all? Well, I know you're a big God, bigger than our problems. You were listening to our prayer, so help us to be strong and courageous. We want to be heroes and keepers of the world. Lastly, dear God, I especially thank you for the air that we breathe that keeps us alive today. Thank you for the stars in the sky and the clouds above us, the sunny days where we can play, and the peaceful nights where we rest and sleep. Please guide and give our elders the wisdom on how we can better take care of the earth, our planet, our only home. Amen. Amen. Please remain.
I believe we're having some technical difficulties in playing uh, the video for our Philippine national anthem, uh, Jane. Also, I'll take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining our forum this morning. We have uh, more than 100 people in uh, our Zoom uh, meeting. Um, and special thanks to our speakers for this morning. Um, it's obviously a very difficult time for everyone having to go back to MECQ here in Metro Manila. Uh, and plus the fact that we're already entering the flood season. Um, so we thank everyone for their time this morning. Okay, so I think we're ready to play the national anthem. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang pag-ibig, kaya sa sinahalan, alam ng puso sa itik mo'y buhay. Upang hinihirang, huyag ka ng mahiting, sa manlulupin, di ka pasisigil, sa nagatang. Morning, everyone again. To give us an overview of the program and introduce our two guest speakers from the House of Representatives, may I call on Dr. Rodel Lasco, the Executive Director of the Oscar M. Lopez Center and was instrumental in organizing the entire forum. Dr. Rodel? Thank you so much, uh, CP. And, uh, Good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, it's really, really quite uh, exciting just uh, looking at the number of participants. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I see there are people from Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and perhaps even from other countries. And uh, as uh, CP and I were planning this, of course, together with the Climate Change Commission and the OML Center, uh, we were wondering you know, how many people would be interested. And to our pleasant surprise, there were literally hundreds uh, who uh, want to be part of this, uh, this event. So that, that shows that you know, science, sea level rise, climate change, it's a really quite an interesting topic, uh, uh, especially of course uh, in our country. And so let me just uh, give you a bit of overview of uh, what we're going to do today. And uh, of course, our key goal is to foster discussion among key actors and institutions and we want to know the state of knowledge on sea level uh, rise or changes uh, and their impacts, impacts, as well as what are the key issues, what are the challenges, and even what are the opportunities that uh, can, uh, can be generated or that, that will be generated by all of these uh, changes. And of course, we've lined up uh, quite uh, uh, really uh, uh, knowledgeable speakers uh, for you uh, this morning. And as mentioned, this is only the first part. Now, today is the first part where we take stock, and that is answering the question why 
should we be concerned about all of this? We want to look at the past, the current and future changes of our sea level and their impacts, both at the global, regional and national scale. And secondly, we also want to discuss the current state of knowledge uh, coming from different perspectives, that is scientific perspectives, of course, also with the insights from our uh, practitioners as well as uh, key actors. And so for today, we'll have uh, inspirational messages and we have a couple of uh, you know, well-known uh, uh, figures and personalities in uh, climate change in the House of Representatives uh, who will give uh, those messages for us. That will be followed by uh, presentations from our esteemed speakers and then some reactions. And then finally, hopefully we'll have an open forum where you can participate. And just a quick poll after that. But uh, this is not the end. This is only the beginning of this journey. And uh, next month, uh, as mentioned by CP, we will uh, try to follow this up by asking the question, what are we doing and what do we need to address uh, you know, the likely impacts of uh, these changes uh, that, that uh, are expected to happen? Again, looking at the present or the past and existing initiatives on addressing these challenges uh, again, in the Philippines, of course, but from the perspectives of various sectors. And we hope to have a panel discussion as well, looking at the gaps and the needs as we move forward. And well, this activity is part of uh, a bigger study on sea level rise. Uh, we want to do a multi-year study, a comprehensive study, assessing the potential or likely impacts of the different scenarios, the climate uh, change scenarios on SLR, or sea level rise and the associated hazards uh, of those. We want to look at some key hotspots as case studies. This will be hopefully selected sites in the Philippines. We also want to do coastal risk mapping and uh, develop decision-making uh, tool or tools. And in all of these, we want to co-produce this with multiple actors and stakeholders. And that is in fact, many of you who are here uh, today. And again, just looking at the key steps of this study, uh, we are now in the scoping uh, or review of SLR researchers and data. So this is a key step towards that. And then from, from this, we move on to identifying sea level rise user needs and then modeling work, uh, sea level rise in, again, mm -hmm. selected coastal cities. And finally, code uh, designing tools and solutions and adaptation uh, to this uh, expected impact of uh, climate change. So that's sort of the big picture of where we want to go. And uh, if you want to interact with us, here's our website. And of course, again, in behalf of the OML Center, we really appreciate this partnership with the Climate Change uh, Commission. And uh, so with that, let me now uh, move on to uh, introduce uh, our first uh, speaker for today who will give us uh, a message. He is a lawyer and the current representative of the first legislative district of Bohol province, that's in central Visayas, one of the most beautiful provinces. And he is the chairperson as well of the House Committee on Climate Change. And as well, he serves as the vice chair of the House Committee on Persons with Disabilities, as well as on tourism. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Congressman or Representative Edgardo Chato. Congressman, please. Uh, thank you very much and good morning uh, to everyone. Am I clearly heard? Yes, Congressman, very clear. Uh, thank you. Deputy yes, Speaker Lauren Ligarda, CCC Secretary Manuel M. de Guzman, Oscar M. Lopez Center, Executive Director, Dr. Rodel D. Lasco, distinguished members of the Climate Change Commission's National Panel of Technical Experts, chaired by Dr. Carlos Primo C. David, colleagues in the uh, government, participants, and online viewers, ladies and gentlemen, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Before I start, I would like to thank first the Climate Change Commission and the Oscar M. Lopez Center for inviting me once again in your online activities geared at mainstreaming climate change. As the chair of the Committee on Climate Change in the House of Representatives, 
I am deeply honored to be part of this event. Your event today is vital in our country's pursuit of climate resiliency. With nations taking far-reaching decisions to channel most of their resources to COVID-19 responses, it is also imperative to give equal attention on the discussion of the looming existential threats of climate change, including sea level rise. I look forward to very informative presentations and dynamic interaction in this respect with the participation of noted scientists and technical experts on climate change in this forum today. Nevertheless, I would just like to give a general picture of our situation and its socioeconomic impact. Today, sea levels are rising due to climate change, threatening lives and livelihoods in low-lying coastal cities and communities around the world. The Philippines, as an archipelagic country situated at the Pacific Ocean, is no stranger to these scenarios. Several studies have shown that the sea level in the Philippines rises faster than the global average due to the gravitational effects caused by mass loss from the Greenland and Antarctica ice sheets and by melting glaciers. By 2050 or 30 years from now, major cities in Metro Manila could be submerged with rising sea level due to climate change. Other areas in the country are at risk as well. On a conservative estimate, I am deeply concerned with reports that 7 million Filipinos live on land that could be threatened by inundation by mid-century. Accordingly, this number could increase to 13 million by 2100s. Assuming the high greenhouse gas emissions continue unabated along the Antarctic instability. Moreover, around 7 million Filipinos will live in places that are below the high tide line by 2050 in an optimistic scenario. This may also double to 11 million by the turn of the century. Future sea level rise in the Philippines will have devastating impact to coastal towns, considering that more than 50% of Philippine municipalities are coastal. Almost all major cities are coastal, while 52 or 62% of the population lives in the coastal zones. In these coastal areas, higher sea levels increase vulnerability to storm surge, posing greater threat to life and property, <laughs> and possibly more and uh, deadly and devastating like Typhoon Yolanda, which we have experienced just a few years back. Higher sea levels could cause saltwater intrusion which will degrade arable land and groundwater, therefore threatening our source of clean potable water. It also seriously threatens our food security. A study by the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, for example, revealed that it may cost a quarter of Philippine fisheries to vanish in 2050. In fact, 59 popular fish species face local extinction of decimation. And this would affect over 1.7 million fisher folks who depend on marine resources for their livelihood. In the island province of Bohol, which I represent in Congress, the rising sea level is already in our midst. It is already a reality that we have to contend with. As you may recall, this February, one of our islands, Batasan Island, was featured in the New York Times report because of sea level rise. The small community of the Tobigan Island chain became waterlogged for at least one third of each year, aggravated, of course, by the 2013 Great Bohol earthquake. On every new and full moon, sea waters rush into people's homes with the worst floods reaching the school and the basketball court. It is reported that the highest point on the Tobigan Islands is at 6.5 feet above sea level. The 1,400 people in the island refused to leave their homes and opted to adapt to this new environment. They find ways to adjust. Houses were placed on blocks of coral stones. They put sheds on stilts and moved their plants 
from flood prone areas, patches of land into uh, portable plots. As one of the premier tourist destinations of the country and uh, the world <coughs> over, people of Bohol has to build a resilient tourism industry. And this is a truly challenging one. For one, the rising sea level, along with warming sea temperatures, threaten the ecosystem and natural wonders of Bohol, which give life to our tourism industry, and which in turn serves as one of the main sources of livelihood of Boholanos. Moreover, as the rising sea level encroach on land, other means of economic productivity are washed out, if not totally lost resulting to poverty amongst our people. My dear friends, we cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. With the runaway global warming, we are in a climatic emergency. Hence, the paradigm shift needed to fully address climate change entails the masses to demand policy makers, world leaders, and even private sector leaders to focus on what needs to be done. And we need to do it rightly and swiftly under the better normal scenarios. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught us well to be more cautious and approach today's risks with concrete measures that will diminish our present vulnerabilities. Incidentally, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated to us that it is possible to achieve the desired results to reduce pollution or to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions if government and the people would take swift and decisive action. I have no doubt at all that with this forum, more Filipinos will be encouraged to act, contribute, and be the solution. But while commitment and passion are essential, it may not be sufficient to face, in the face of climate emergency, there is a great urgency to act swiftly and decisively. We have to rethink how the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned that if we don't take heed of the call for a climate emergency, the desire and the dire consequences of climate change may be irreversible by the end of the decade 2030. In this context, I appeal to the scientific and academic community government agencies, fellow legislators and LGUs, the private sector and the civil society organizations and non-government groups to forge greater unity and continued cooperation in developing immediate and long-term solutions to address our common challenge that is climate change and in building more resilient communities with science as the heart of our plans, programs, projects, and activities. I know that Climate Change Commission is going to engage all of us again in the coming months to champion LGU-centric adaptation measures. The core modular series and climate field schools, which are pursued with key implementing agencies and non-government entities as partners, are important mechanisms to translate and cascade climate science into concrete policies, actions and that will benefit our people to the last mile. As chairperson of the Committee on Climate Change in the House of Representatives, together with Representative Loren de Garda and other climate change champions in Congress, please be assured that aside from our legislative task to strengthen climate mitigation and adaptation, programs are also with you in the we are also with you in the quest for climate justice. Um, in the succeeding months and sessions of Congress, the House Committee on Climate Change shall step up its legislative inquiries to demand climate action and accountability from state and non-state actors and uh, duty holders in the face of climate emergency. <clears throat> Again, let me congratulate the Climate Change Commission, the Oscar M. Lopez Foundation, and all participants for coming together in this noble event. But to paraphrase one philosopher, this is not a dinner party. I pray that we will emerge stronger from this momentous event to realize concrete, swift, 
and decisive actions to combat climate change. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Mabuhay po tayo. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Chato. What a challenging message. And uh, just imagining the beauty of Panglao Beach, I still, we have fun, very fond memories. And uh, of course, that beach may be at risk uh, because of uh, sea level rise and climate change. So thank you so much again, uh, Representative uh, Chato, for uh, sharing your thoughts uh, with us. And so moving on, uh, let's, uh, uh, we'll also hear from uh, one of uh, our um, uh, champions, one of, in fact, perhaps the most uh, known champion of uh, climate change uh, in the country. She has been uh, advocating for uh, green development and climate change and environmental conservation uh, for so long. And uh, right now she is uh, the representative of the lone district of Antique. And she is also the deputy speaker of the House of Representatives. And uh, as a former senator, she worked for the enactment of uh, uh, several landmark uh, laws on environmental governance, such as the Clean Air Act, the Solid Waste Management Act, the Climate Change Act, of course, which created the Climate Change Commission, and Come the on. Disaster oh, Waste Reduction and really Management turn. Act. Hold on. Commission on Ad and UNSDR's Global Champion for Resilience. And so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know who I'm talking about, none other than Deputy Speaker Lauren Legarda. Representative Legarda, please, good morning. Okay, good morning. I'm testing. Good morning, morning ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. I can see my colleague, um, one of my favorite uh, governors now, my colleague in Congress, in um, a sister province of Antique, uh, Congressman Ed Chato. Why do I say sister province? Because many of the things that you have, heritage and culture, we also have in my beloved province. And many of the things that you are doing, since I am new in local governance, and you're one of the not just veteran, but outstanding local government officials, not just of the Visayas, but of the country, we try to emulate. In fact, many times I've told Governor Ed Chato, can you please teach and mentor the uh, local government officials of Antique? And I believe that the University of Antique is invited in this webinar. I hope there'll be a roll call and UA President um, Crespo or and or all the officials and chancellors should be online to learn much from Bohol, to learn much from the other scientists and experts. So hi, Ed, I miss seeing you in our hearings and session. Perhaps we could have a virtual climate change session. Have we had one? Not yet, because the last one I attended was in that uh, committee room in Mitra building. We have not had a climate change virtual session, have we? We're organizing one soon. Okay, may I suggest, again, I'm not reading yet my speech, you know, when, when I talk, nagiging meeting. May I suggest, Mr. Chairman, uh, that we include not just the Climate Change Commission and the experts, but local governments, because the way forward really for climate change adaptation especially in the better normal, is yung kaalaman at yung disiplina at yung galaw at gawa ng ating mga lokal na pamahalaan. Being a former outstanding local government official, perhaps we could invite, especially those which are vulnerable, like Mohol, Antique, and, many, and those in the eastern seaboard as well. If my chairman agrees, uh, we can help coordinate that. Of course, the Climate Change Commission could help us as well. Then we can also include LGUs that have already established uh, model projects like um, Del Carmen in Chargao, which is a recipient of the People's Survival Fund, and they can mentor other local governments how to apply for the PSF and how to establish, with or without funding from the PSF, using their ERA, 
a climate field school. In fact, uh, may I suggest, Mr. Chair, and the Climate Change Commission, I'm sure, are online, for them to do a simple uh, alituntunin kung pa paano ba magtayo ng climate field school. Wag nang intayin si Chair Ed Chato at si Deputy Speaker Lauren Legarda na nag-establish ng Climate Change Commission na gumawa ng bagong batas to institutionalize climate field schools. Let us mandate that every LGU must have its own climate field school and let the climate field schools funded by government money, like Del Carmen in Siargao, uh, Vice Mayor Coro, can mentor and be part of our webinar. Do I hear a voice of agreement from my chairman, Ed Chato? Yes, uh, you will soon re receive your schedule of activities uh, for the series of discussions. It will involve heavily the local governments as well as the uh, different partners of our committee and as well as the Climate Change Commission. And uh, likewise, we look forward also to the establishment of Climate Change Center, one that would really provide a venue, especially for the younger sector. Um, Deputy Speaker, the youth is a very important component other than uh, our local governments championing it. So we have to mobilize the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, different schools and uh, to, to champion also on, on climate change. They are the Very future good. generation. I'm Thank glad you. that you mentioned that. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Yes, we need the youth involved because uh, while we are a few years away from being part of the youth sector, <laughs> but um, like tomorrow in the Stories for a Better Normal, which is uh, every Thursday webinar with the Climate Change Commission uh, at 10 o'clock, we have millennial, urban, and uh, uh, gardeners and farmers. But that's another story altogether. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Adelasco, who in 2007, together with a panel of experts, have been aiding me, assisting me, and uh, my consultants in my office in the Senate way back in 2007. I would like to thank uh, Rodel that uh, we may not uh, see each other very often, but that spirit of advisory and consultancy still exists with Dr. Adelasco and former Chancellor Rex Cruz and um, Dr. Pulhin, as well as uh, Dr. Rosa Perez and the uh, IPCC uh, experts, Rodel. We can uh, have a Zoom session as a reunion at the same time talking about uh, science and what we can do during these times of pandemic. Also, yes, I would like to acknowledge, of course, my favorite agency of government, uh, which uh, oversight function of the chair, uh, Kong Ed Chato, and this is the Climate Change Commission, which was established upon the enactment of the Climate Change Act, which I authored way back in 2007, enacted in 2009, operationalized in 2011, and uh, headed by no less. Not many people know that the head of the Climate Change Commission by law is the president of the republic that is how powerful i wanted the commission to be and this was first established in the aquino administration and then later on now it's still uh, ongoing but the operational day-to-day -day and the policy making is done by the vice chair and uh, the present vice chair is commissioner manny de guzman hello manny are you there we also have a lawyer in the team of commissioners and we have Commissioner Rachel Herrera, who is from Mindanao. She's from Davao. So I'd also like to greet uh, C.P. David, head of a national technical uh, group of experts of the commission. Again, I included that along, I think it was a suggestion of the experts IPCC when I was writing the law that we include this uh, panel of experts. So I'm so proud, uh, Chair uh, Ed, of the law that uh, I wrote in 2007, and with a measly funds in all these years, 13 years, uh, they have done so much to mainstream CCAM, climate change adaptation mitigation, and even disaster risk reduction and resilience in local governments when the budget allows. But you know, in this virtual world online, no budget is needed. We just need action. So seize the moment. Let us not make the pandemic the reason for our inaction. Let us make the COVID the reason for our proactive action. 
Number one, to beat the virus. So we all heal as one, as they say. But second, so that as we evolve to the better normal, what we call the new norm, we will not go back, but we will do better and not build back better only, but we will establish resilient communities. And that can be done only by mentorship of the experts, CP David, Rodelasco, Climate Change Commission, and even the local government experts. Now, let me read my speech. So I would also like to greet our speakers for today, our reactors, our guests from various government agencies and institutions, civil society organizations, the academe, and of course, our growing in number. So consisting of at least 7,641 islands, our beloved great country, the Philippines, has one of the largest coastlines in the world, spanning at roughly 36,000 kilometers. This, together with the geographical location of our country, makes us highly vulnerable to the effects of sea level rise. The Senate or the satellite observations for 1993 to 2015 show that the Philippine region experienced a five to seven millimeters a year rise of sea level, which is twice the global average. This was, I think, mentioned by Congressman Chato. A study by the Asian Development Bank identified 19 of the 25 cities most exposed to a one meter sea level rise. And they're located in Asia and the Pacific region, seven of them in the Philippines, namely Manila, Taguig, Caloocan, Davao, there you are, Rachel, Butuan, Malabon, that's where I was born, and Iloilo, that's my region. About 60% of the total population of the Philippines live in coastal cities and municipalities. That's why this webinar is so important because more than half of our population live in coastal areas, such as the towns in my home province in Antique. Of our 18 uh, towns, 15 are coastal and the five are mountains, where the mountains meet the sea. As beautiful as Bohol, Ed. I will not say more beautiful because you might uh, uh, contest me and there will be an interpolation in this webinar. So, magkasingganda. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC uh, Fifth Assessment Report, also projects that sea level rise will accelerate. We all know that. This will have devastating consequences for the Philippines since higher water levels in the base will mean that typhoons will do more damage with higher storm surge, and already around 20 of the tropical storms rage across the country every year and more intense and more frequent. These climate hazards are projected to damage livelihood, as we all know, infrastructure, as we've seen, to trigger population displacement that causes internal migration, worsen unemployment, which already is so bad, and disrupt the delivery of basic goods and services. And, in for, and of course, adversely impact on agriculture and also adversely affects the youth of our country. Hence, with the urgent need to address extreme weather and climate change related events, such as sea level rise, adaptation strategies to manage the various risks are very crucial to how different countries that are vulnerable to these specific tasks or specific risks connect and become ready and resilient to the economic impacts such, uh, that such events bring. However, aside from these climate challenges, our country is likewise faced by the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, which tests our resilience even more severely. And so with the climate impacts and with a pandemic really a lot of challenges are facing us but that seize the moment and do proactive climate action to beat them with this our country needs recovery plans 
that will address economic, environmental, and climate resilience, thus a greener recovery, a sustainable recovery. I would like to take note that the Economic Affairs Committee, uh, Chair Ed, has been holding hearings on economic recovery, but I do not see the presence of the Climate Change Commission or of the Climate Change Committee of Chair Ed or even of the Ecology Committee in the House because everyone says, we should go back to normal. No, we need green economies now. So may I suggest perhaps with a ComSec, if Chair Ed can be made a crucial part of that Economic Affairs Committee on all the economic uh, stimulus packages so that there could be a climate resilient recovery uh, bill that the lower house, the House of Reps can actually do. As the world responds to the pandemic, it must build back better, or should I say, build a greener and more resilient economy. We can return to the old way of doing things, or we can get on a new path. The answer is obvious. We don't want to go back to the old way. No to throwing garbage in waterways. We should go zero waste. We should implement the Clean Water Act. We should implement ecological solid waste management. We should implement the Renewable Energy Law, Environmental Education Awareness Act, even the Clean Air Act. So we must have a path that makes human society more resilient, more equitable, healthier, stronger, more ecological. For one, House Bill 6864, or the Better Normal for the Workplace, Communities, and Public Spaces Act of 2020, and I accepted all the climate and environment amendments of Chair Ed Chato. And this bill is not just a health bill. That is the reason why it was transferred from the Health Committee to my new norm committee under the special committee created by the speaker. And it is really a climate and an environmental bill in more ways than one because the way to the new norm, as you would see provisions, uh, really exemplify a better normal in a greener recovery. We sponsored it, we co-authored it. It seeks to provide public health safeguards to prevent further spread of COVID-19 once containment measures are lifted and economic and social activities return, not just to Metro Manila, but to the rest of the country, and at the same time accelerate transformational change to restore the balance between human, social, economic, and natural ecosystems. The Global Commission on Adaptation, where I'm also one of the commissioners, urges every sector to integrate climate resilience into decisions at all levels with particular focus on resilience in infrastructure and financial decisions. These goals are interconnected and investments in the pandemic recovery should address multiple challenges. We must seize the opportunity to transform how we understand, plan, finance, and respond to risks. We must act now, not wait for the next crisis to hit, and investing in climate resilience is better and less costly than waiting until after a disaster strikes. Our transition to a better normal is also the most opportune time to infuse low carbon investments to the economy and the significant consideration for the vulnerable and the marginalized sectors to be at the core of the green recovery planning and implementation processes ensuring further inclusive and sustainable development in a sense that no one is left behind. Over the long term, inclusive, sustainable, and equitable economies are more robust. To the Climate Change Commission, my favorite agency, which I gave birth to. To the National Panel of Technical Experts and the Oscar M. Lopez Center, I am confident that this event will stimulate discussions for us 
to understand many more aspects of the climate crisis and sea level changes and the urgent call to action for which all of us have a role to play in contributing to the climate and environmental resilience of our country and the generations to come. With that, I thank you, Dr. Lasco, CP David, Ed, and the Climate Change Commission for this opportunity. And I will continue to join you and observe you in this webinar today. May I also encourage you to do regional and provincial webinars focusing on specific hazards, vulnerabilities, and risks of those localities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Chato, and of course, our mother, DS Lauren Legarda, for your messages. There are a few questions in our chat box for, for the two of you, as well as in FB Live. We will forward it uh, to you accordingly. I we can answer, answer it now if you wish. Is there a time to answer well, it, or there's no time for that? Uh, if you can answer it quickly, there's one for Congressman Chato. A question from Celso Diaz. Uh, what are the measures that Bohol province uh, has done to reduce the ecological footprint of tourism? I guess it's a parallel but uh, in a way indirect um, issue with sea level rise and climate change. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I would like to start with the environment code that the province of Bohol adopted. I think this will give idea also to other LGUs. We were the first province in the country to adopt an environment code that will strengthen also the implementation of environmental laws in the province of Bohol. That was way back when I was vice governor. At the time, was, uh, I was president of the Vice Governors League of the Philippines, and we distributed copies of that for as guide to other provinces in the country. It enumerates a lot of environmental uh, policy frameworks, which the, the succeeding administrations also has to be guided on. One of the major discussions that uh, we had with uh, Deputy Speaker Legarda was the commonality in our understanding of the principle of uh, um, uh, fossil fuel reduction and the, uh, the emission reduction. By adopting a uh, policy province-wide in Bohol, we said it, we Bohol should be a no to coal province. Uh, we are heavily de, um, uh, moving towards uh, renewable energy, and uh, this was a very hotly debated issue. But the private sector groups in the province of Bohol already has developed that kind of uh, understanding and passion to preserve the environment. So when it comes to uh, implementation of uh, the, the the different laws that adopts regulations also at the level of the province, uh, whether it's a provincial government ordinance or national government ordinance related to the environment. Uh, these are addressed uh, not only by government, but also advocated by the private sector. Also in the province of Bohol, uh, when it comes to uh, resources, uh, forest resources and uh, sea uh, marine life uh, resources, there are policy uh, uh, directions also that be, are being adopted. In the coastal areas of Bohol, for example, we have uh, one of the biggest and largest mangrove plantations. Uh, this is also uh, connected to uh, sea level rise issues. But we highlight also the fact that there has to be more on the area of proactive response, considering that as we treasure our beaches, as we highlight our uh, our resources in terms of tourism attractions, the impacts of environment also on tourism remains to be a threat. So sustainability really needs the resiliency of the community, of the people, and the strategies that we adopt. Thank you, Congressman Chato. I was uh, with a few friends who hailed from Bohol, by the way, you know, last weekend, and they were all praises with uh, how the LGUs are conducting uh, well, limiting mobility, no, even within barangays. No, so meron daw pesta dun sa isang barangay. It's only the people within the barangay who can actually participate in the fiesta. No, so uh, apparently there's something good that's uh, happening in uh, at the LGU level in Bohol and limiting uh, the outbreak of COVID, no, in in your province. So congratulations. That's 
That's right. When it comes to fiesta celebrations this time, uh, the, the protocols are strictly implemented. Bohol is a very religious province, but the moment the protocol and no masses, uh, no celebrations of fiesta in a big scale, they can celebrate only by family lockdowns of towns celebrating fiestas. These are all implemented well uh, during the, uh, the, the, the pandemic. Thank you, Congressman Chato. To D.S. Legarda, I guess this is a general question for you. Uh, you have many advocacies, and of course, we thank you for uh, pushing the uh, environment and climate change uh, issues in Congress. I, I cannot stress enough how important it, it is to have a uh, kakampe in Congress. No? Case in point, in uh, January of this year, the NPTE uh, suggested to declare a state of climate emergency. Uh, of which our colleagues, including yourself, uh, picked up in Congress no? and their corresponding uh, policies uh, for that. No? So my, my question is really on policy making. When you, when, when you make uh, policies, um, how, how important is it that the policies are actually implementable on the ground? As uh, you may have uh, already known, there are many policies that, that are good, but uh, where, where we are lacking is actually in the implementation of these. No? So are there new strategies in Congress so that uh, these policies are actually uh, done and really take effect on the ground? Thank you for that question, because that's been my challenge since 1998 when I first uh, joined Congress, joined the Senate. Let me just enumerate. We have the laws for every uh, sector or every area. We have the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law in 2001, RA9003. We have the Clean Water Act of 2003. We have the Clean Air Act, uh, 2000, 1999. We have the Environmental Education Awareness Act. We have the Climate Change Act, as you know, which created you. We have the People Survival Fund, the funding mechanism for local governments and POs and NGOs. We have the Environmental Education Awareness Act, which DepEd is supposed to be implementing. We have the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Act. I'm so proud of the newly enacted law when I was in my last term as senator, the expanded National Integrated Protected Areas Law, where more than 94 protected areas in four decades, we were able to do the work in four months. So there were protected areas, marine and terrestrial, which were being raped and not being protected. And the DNR came to me and asked me, what can we do about it? I said, you know, even if I'm elected senator 10 times and I have three lifetimes, we will not be able to declare these as protected areas. So as we say in Antique, tanan, tanan ipagsama all in one and so the expanded there were challenges legally but then i said no puede yan, because it's not physically impossible for any lawmaker to declare all the protected areas every time you know uh, when i uh, offered the mount kitanglad protected area in bukidnon in my first term it took me several months that's just one now we declared uh, I'm not sure. I think, I hope Ipat Luna is here. More than 94. So let me just say that we have the laws in place. Mm -hmm. May also seek the um, support of uh, the Senate, uh, maybe, uh, and Chair Chato would help me, so that the Better Normal Act is enacted into law while we are in ECQ, even after the ECQ and GCQ, because it is not just a wearing of mask bill. It is a climate and environmental bill. Believe me, look at it, CP. Look at our GAA of 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. Sabi nga ng mga tao sa LBRMO, sa budget, sa Senado, ma'am, kayo ba ho ay finance chair or climate at environment? Because the GAA became a green GAA. So, back to your question, what are the challenges? Kailangan... Yung implementation. Yes, 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 I'm getting to that. Kailangan gumawa kayo ng ganitong webinar kasama ang lahat ng ah, tinatagalog ko na, no? When I want to stress a point and I'm a bit angry, I speak in Filipino. Kailangan isama 
lahat ng ahensya ng gobyerno para ipatupad nila ang ating maaayos na batas para okay i enacted to the law i wrote it i funded it when i was chair from 2015 to 2019 never has it happened let's say that the uh denr uh commission on solid waste was ever funded zero funding since i enacted the law but when i became chair again i don't want to sound yabang but it has to be said i funded it and there were uh there was hundreds of millions funding and i hope they spent it properly so the climate change commission it was largely unfunded the people survival fund was an unfunded law but i put one billion pesos in fact senator drilon also supported me in funding that the minority and the majority now we see local governments benefiting from it including del carmen in faraway shargao so you see thinking about it with a vision and enacting it is one big challenge including my defense of the paris agreement where a country almost left wow that's another story altogether so uh in my nine in my three terms and enacting all of that that's a challenge funding it is another challenge the third and most important lahat ng ahensya ng gobyerno denr kaman o da kaman dswd kaman o dnd ikaw man ay dole o ikaw man ay deped ipatupad po ninyo ang ating mga batas lto kaman ng dotr or suc kaman or chair now i can't keep on lecturing this way because i walk my talk you've seen my office cp uh you've been uh I, to both offices my god i fight bins in waste segregation now i ask you if the climate change commission or the oml center or your respective homes no matter how big or small are not even segregated then let's forget these webinars then we're not implementing our laws if the dnr does not have a minimum of three bins if we don't have compost pits if we don't have mrfs in our localities if you are not segregating bote lata plastic and paper waste na nakahiwalay at food waste na hiwalay forget this virtual online webinars let's just do it at home and so let's huddle e-huddle all the agencies of government but then again why keep on looking to government we have the academe why keep on looking to the academe we have the private sector let's stop blaming each other or passing the buck to the others let us make sure that each home each community and the oversight function rests on us yung mga mahilig mag facebook mahilig mag text mahilig mag online ikaw ba ay nag waste segregation na yan ang gusto kong marinig pakita nga ng inyong gulayan can i see your urban garden can i see uh, yung kalamansing uh, tinanim sa recycled na bote lata o plastic yon so ang aking sagot mahabang sagot sa maiklimong tanong ay yung pagsasabatas nagawa ko na eh yung pagpopondo nagawa ko na rin eh hindi ko sinasabing hindi ko trabaho magpatupad sa buong bansa pero magtulungan tayo para katukin ang mga tuktok ng mga tao at ang mga puso nila para sundin ang batas and why should you follow filipino i look at you straight in the eye now on this webinar because it is for your own sake it is for your own health it is to save lives and that life could be your own it makes good economic sense to follow our environmental laws otherwise we and our families will be direly affected uh pardon me for my passion thank you That's no. how i am when i speak about climate and environment mm -hmm. I think we need that you know, daily dose of uh, your sermon so that we just get reminded on a daily basis. Incidentally here, Senator Loren, here's my urban garden. Huh? I'm following good. you. 
can you can you send me on Viber after this? We will, uh, we will. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> in in our own small way, it can be a one square meter patch of land. Uh, kung pwede ko lang pakita sa iyo, katabi ko dito ang aking kutsay kalamansi at ang aking dill uh, namumulaklak. Pero sa likod ko, yan ang aking air purifier. Hindi ako buibili ng mga haling electronic dahil yung San Siberia ang aking uh, air purifier. I'm sure alam niyan. Tapos yung aking uh, bulaklak ay tanim ko yan sa garden ko. At yung bambu ay pinutol ko ngayon umaga at para may dekorasyon. Hindi ako buibili ng gulay hindi ako buibiling bulaklak, hindi ako buibiling air purifier, lahat natural. At hindi ako nag-aircon, uh, nakabukas lang ang aking bintana. Kaya medyo namamawis, pero titiisin ko. At saka, ang aking kuryente ay solar. So, at mer ang aking tubig ay galing sa aking uh, water catchment. Wala akong arkitekto o engineer. Ang alulud ng bahay ko nagpupunta sa isang water catchment. Ako lang ang gumawa. Meron underwater cistern at meron above ground. So I catch rainwater. My uh, solar system on my roof. I have a little urban garden. I have a compost pit. I have an MRF. I never buy gulay. Sorry na lang ang supermarket sa akin because I grow my own food. Mayabang pero kailangan ipagyabang pag tama ang ginagawa. Yeah, walk the talk. Thank you, Senator Lauren. Um, and incidentally, in... Uh, our audience are officials of the executive department. So, narinig nilang lahat ang iyong uh, lecture. Very good. Uh, magtrabaho. Uh, included in our audience, of course, I should mention Secretary Manny de Guzman is there, Isaac Manny, Commissioner Rachel Ann Herrera of uh, CCC as well. USEC René Solidum of DOST is the USEC of, uh, for Climate Change Research is also in the audience. Uh, very early in our webinar, USEC Annalisa Te, uh, one of our friends in the DNR. Is very good. Hello to Anna and hello to USEC Solidum. Of course, I've been working with them. They're very good. <laughs> also, USEC uh, Maria Catalina Cabral of DPWH. So, oh, very good. So, we have DPWH, so we si USEC Cabral. Uh, oh, I'd like to ask Kathy about the green green school buildings. We've been talking about that. Tell her to show you examples of green school buildings they've done. Perfect. We'll take note of that. ASEC Alan Silor of DICT is also with us, and ASEC Paula Alvarez of uh, DOF is also with us. Good morning, Hi, everyone. Paula. Yes. Thank you again, Senator Lauren and Thank Kong you. Tato. I hope you can stay and uh, listen to some of the technical sessions that we have this morning. But, In fact, but thank you um, very much. Yes, thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Kong Chato. Now let's move on to our technical session. We have five speakers and uh, I should mention that in between the presentations, we are also going to have quick polls for our audience. So just click on your choice or answer, and in fact, we'll show you the first uh, poll question right now. How likely do you think will you and your community be affected by sea level rise? So just click on your answer. You're given roughly 30 seconds to um, accomplish this. And as you accomplish this, you actually also see the results uh, instantaneously. As mentioned earlier by Kong Chato and Diaz Legarda, more than 50% of our population are actually in coastal regions and they are for sure vulnerable to sea level rise and all other accompanying uh, problems that are brought upon by climate change. Okay, so it looks like majority of us uh, feel that we are likely to be affected by sea level rise. It might change you know, your opinion once you hear our uh, scientists you know, when they talk about sea level rise and how actually uh, are we um, in terms of uh, combating sea level rise and its accompanying uh, hazards and, and risks. And you might just change your mind later on and put in extremely likely after you hear their lectures. 
Okay, let's move on. I should also acknowledge the presence of Dr. Luli Cruz, one of our national scientists, uh, who is also Professor Emeritus at UPMSI, and also uh, University President Pablo Crespo of the University of Antique, present. Siyempre, mga colleagues natin at the NPTE, Dr. Leandro Buendia is, is there. Uh, NPTE member, Dr. Rosa Perez, and academician of the NAST, Mujikiwi Santos is also with us. He is from DA. Okay, let's move on to our next uh, speaker, lecturer. He is the current director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore and is the chair of the Asian School of the Environment in Nanyang Technological University. His research concerns sea level change with the aim of understanding and integrating the internal and external mechanisms that have determined sea level changes in the past and which will shape such changes in the future. His research impacts upon important ecological, ethical, social, economic, and political problems specifically facing coastal regions. We're very happy to have Dr. Benjamin Horton uh, with us today. Please go ahead, Dr. Horton. Good morning, everyone. Uh, do I have the ability to share my screen? Yes, Dr. Horton. You should, yes. Okay. Please go ahead. I hope everyone can see the screen, see the PowerPoint presentation that I have prepared for you today. As a brief introduction, um, I'm Professor Ben Horton. I am, as previously been said, the director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore, which is located at Nanyang Technological University. The mission of the Earth Observatory of Singapore is to conduct fundamental research on the topics of geohazards and increasingly so climate change. And importantly, to use this fundamental research to create a safer and sustainable world in Southeast Asia. Now we have many initiatives on climate change, but I briefly like to show a video which illustrates them and in particular illustrates the importance of climate change. By 2100, over 1 billion people on Earth will live in low-lying coastal zones, subject to flooding on an annual basis. 70% of these will live in Southeast Asia, one of the most vulnerable regions in the world to climate change. A narrow window of time offers an opportunity for great hope. The next decade will be the most critical for the future existence of society. Across Southeast Asia, our stable climate system is changing rapidly. The atmosphere is warming at an alarming rate. Floods, droughts, typhoons are bigger, devastating millions of people, and the ice sheets are melting. All are having a critical impact on every aspect of life we rely on for our survival. The Earth Observatory of Singapore is conducting cutting edge research in an effort to find solutions to the climate issues facing our region and planet this century, which all require long-term thinking. Through research, education, and engagement, we aim to provide critical information to governments, businesses, and communities in order to mitigate and adapt to the challenges ahead As I said, the Earth Observatory of Singapore has many initiatives regarding climate change. One of those is the Southeast Asia Sea Level Program. Sea level rise is a complex issue. Sea level, despite its name, is not a flat, planar surface. There are areas on our Earth that have far greater than the global average sea level 
Conversely, there are areas that have far less than the global average sea level. And that is because there are a variety of global, regional and local processes that influence sea level in time and in space. Local processes. For example, if you looked at this schematic graph on the left hand side, we need to understand the hydrological cycle. The extraction of groundwater for commercial, agricultural and industrial use decreases land heights, causing subsidence, amplifying the effect of sea level rise. At the regional scale, in particular here in Southeast Asia, we must understand tectonics. Both between and within earthquakes, the land height can change, and that can amplify or diminish the effects of sea level rise. At the global scale, we have the influence of mass and volume. A volume change is illustrated in the bottom left animation. This is the thermal expansion of our oceans. As we have increased atmospheric temperatures in the 20th and 21st century, these temperatures are transferred to the surface layers of our oceans. This causes our oceans to expand and therefore sea level to rise. This process has dominated sea level rise in the 20th century, contributing up to around 40% of the sea level rise that we have recorded. In the top left, we have the mass change, the melting of land-based ice on our glaciers, ice caps and ice sheets. This process is worryingly increasing in its contributions to sea level rise. In the 21st century, our contributions from Greenland and Antarctica alone contribute around 40% of our global mean sea level. This is worrying because these ice sheets have huge reservoirs of fresh water. Greenland, if all of Greenland was to melt, it would raise global sea levels by some seven meters. But it is Antarctica that the scientific community is increasingly worried about. This is a colossal ice sheet. It has a surface area analogous to the United States. It is approximately four kilometers thick in the central part of the ice sheet. And if all of this ice sheet was to melt, it would contribute over 60 meters to global mean sea level. Therefore, you only need to melt a small percentage of this ice sheet to cause devastating effects in Southeast Asia and globally. In the bottom right, we have one of the local processes that significantly influences sea level, and that is land substance from the removal of groundwater, something that is in particularly important in Manila, something I'll show later on in this presentation. We also have two other processes that influence sea level on a regional scale and are slightly more complex. On the left hand side, we have a process known as glacial isostatic adjustment. The present day ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica and their extinct counterparts that existed some 20,000 years ago at the last glaciation produced a significantly spatially variable sea level response. These ice sheets are colossal in mass and they lay on the Earth's surface. The Earth's surface is not a brittle hard so, uh, subject, it is a deformable plastic. So areas underneath the ice sheet subside with the weight. When this ice sheet is removed, the land uplifts. At the margins of the ice sheets, these are elevated when the ice sheet is at its maximum extent and then they subside as the ice sheets melt. On the right hand side, we have a process known as sea level fingerprinting. And again, this is associated with the mass of an ice sheet. These ice sheets are colossal in mass and therefore they exert on the ocean significant gravitational attraction. When the ice sheets are at the maximum, the water is attracted to it. When the ice sheets decrease in mass, the gravitational attraction decreases and the water retreats away. So we need to know where we are on the earth in relationship to these ice sheets with respect to the land height changes and the sea level fingerprinting of the ocean surface. So let's get a, take a trip back 
through time. On the left hand side, we have an animation of our extinct ice sheets. You have a polar projection. The center part of this animation is on the North Pole. You see the continents of North America and Eurasia. The animation shows the contraction of the ice sheets at 2,000 year intervals from 20,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum to the present day. The increase in atmospheric temperatures, in this case driven by a change in the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, caused a contraction of these ice sheets. And there would be significant land height changes depending on whether you were underneath the ice sheets or at the periphery. But the melting of these ice sheets contributed a colossal 120 meters of sea level rise in the last 20,000 years. And that had profound effects in Southeast Asia, which you can see on the animation of a series of geographies at 2,000 year time steps for the last 20,000 years. 20,000 years ago, sea levels were 120 meters below present, and you could simply walk from the islands of the Philippines through to Borneo. If you were located in Singapore, you could walk to the, uh, the coastlines of Malaysia and Sumatra. But the melting of the ice in the Northern Hemisphere caused the flooding of these landscapes. The other thing I'd like you to note is that the flooding isn't linear the melting of these ice sheets isn't linear. There are tipping points. 14 or so thousand years ago, the ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere, in particular the Laurentide that was over North America, collapsed, causing colossal sea level rises of some 30 to 40 millimeters per year, breaking the land bridges in Southeast Asia. So depending on where you are with respect to these ice sheets causes a very different sea level pattern through time, which I'm trying to show in the series of these graphics. On the x-axis is time before present in a thousand years. On the y-axis is relative sea level. Scotland. Scotland was underneath the Fennoscandinavian ice sheet in northwestern Europe. A coastline that formed some 16 or 1,000 years ago, despite the increase in ocean volume, the land has outpaced it. The land has uplifted so greatly that coastlines formed 16,000 years ago are now found at elevations some 40 metres above present in Scotland. New York City. New York City is at the margins of the Laurentide ice sheet. Therefore, it was uplifted at the last glacial maximum and has been sinking while the oceans have been rising. And therefore, coastlines 10,000 years ago that were found at present are now found 30 meters below present. What about Manila? Well, Manila is not influenced significantly by these land level changes from these extinct ice sheets. It shows the contribution of mass and volume changes. Between 12,000 and 8,000, sea levels rose rapidly in and around Manila. At around 8,000 years ago, these northern hemisphere ice sheets had disappeared and Greenland and Antarctica were relatively stable and therefore over the last 6,000 years, really until the beginning of the 20th century, sea level has been remarkably stable. So how do these effects, how does the understanding of the past provide information for the present and the future? Well the effect of these extinct ice sheets continues for thousands of years because the Earth responds very slowly to the weights on the Earth's crust. So Stockholm in Sweden, here we're looking at an instrumental record of sea level rise. So these instrumental records are from tide gauges. Tide gauges are set up for mariners. They, cause the, they record the high and low water every single day, the average of which is the average sea level of that day. You can add them up and you get the average sea level of the year, and then you can create a time series. In Stockholm in Sweden, despite the global warming and the melting and the increase in volume of our ocean basins, the land uplift has outpaced that. Stockholm in Sweden has recorded around a 50 centimetre sea level fall at rates averaging around four millimetres per year. 
Stockholm in Sweden does not have a sea level rise problem. It has the problem of creating more coastal land area. New York City at the margins of the Laurentide ice sheet. It has been subsiding. So it has an increase in sea level of around 50 centimetres since the 1880s at about four millimetres per year, twice the global average. What about Manila? Well, in the early part of the 20th century, Manila tracked the global average at around one and a half to two millimetres per year. But beginning in the 1960s and the 1970s, we've shown a pronounced acceleration, which is due in the area around the tide gauge to land substance associated with groundwater withdrawal. So what about the future? So first of all, let's look at Stockholm and New York City. We're going to look at projections of sea level moving out to 2050 under two emission scenarios. In the blue is a low emission scenario. It's academically or scientifically known as RCP 2.6, but we can think about this as the Paris Agreement, keeping our global mean temperatures throughout the 21st century below two degrees C above our industrial um, baseline. In the red is the business as usual or the projection scenario that we were on prior to the COVID pandemic. So in Sweden, in the graphics, we're showing the 50th percentile or the median. In Sweden, under the high or low emission scenario, we are going to get either a moderate rise or a falling sea level because the land height is continuing to dominate sea level rise. Conversely, in New York City, where we have the land subsidence, we will have sea level rise amplifying the global effects. What about looking out to 2100? Well, now we start to see the clear differences between a low and a high emission future. This is because under the high emission future, we pass that two degrees C threshold. We therefore are melting catastrophically the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica, and we get a very clear differentiation in sea level between the high and the low emission futures. In Stockholm and Sweden, under the low emission future, sea level rise will continue not to be a problem. They will continue to have sea level fall because the land height is dominating. But under the high emission future, for the first time in 20,000 years, the coastlines around Stockholm change from falling to rising sea level. In New York City, we get a significant difference between the low and the high emission future. Under a low emission future, you have a rate of rise of around 70 centimetres at the 50th percentile, whereas that is some one metre greater at 1.7 metres under the high emission future. The differences between these are really significant. A high emission future gives you rates of sea level rise in and around New York City of around 30 to 40 millimetres per year. The last time that we saw that was 14,000 years ago. There is not a coastal ecosystem that can survive those rates. There is not an engineering solution that can defend Manhattan. What about looking at the Philippines? So we're going to look at Manila. Again, the low and the high emission futures. If we continue the process of groundwater withdrawal, when we look through to 2050, we have rates of between 60 and 50 centimetres under the low and the high emission. When we go out to 2100, the dominant processes of groundwater withdrawal are amplified by the loss of the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. And the Philippines record some of the highest rates of sea level rise globally, a 50th percentile of 2.1 meters. And if you look at the box, the 95th percentile, so in one in 20 chance of 3.2 meters. But the effects in the Philippines is gonna be very spatially variable. 
we ran another model looking at Cebu. Cebu, the tide gauge does not record groundwater withdrawal. Here, as we look through to 2050 and 2100, we see rates of between 30 and 22 centimetres by 2050, half the rate in Manila. If we go out to 2100, we have a scenario that is relatively similar to New York City, around 50%, 50 centimetres of rise by 2100 and I would state to you that the rates of sea level rise under the low emission future that the Philippines could adequately adapt their coastlines to have prosperous ecosystems prosperous infrastructure and economy I would say that is not the case under a high emission future even in Cebu of 1.5 meters what are the impacts of that well, sea level rise decimates ecosystems. It contaminates your freshwater aquifers, contaminates your agricultural fields, therefore prov um, producing considerable stresses on food and water supply. Another impact is its influence on storm surges. They make them of a greater magnitude and they significantly reduce the confidence interval or the recurrence interval of storm surges. So this is a graphic that comes from the IPCC's sixth assessment. I am a lead or a, a um, editorial author on the sixth assessment. So on the left hand side, we're looking at the high emission future going out to the mid part of the 20th century. And we're looking at the amplification of extreme events. There's much spatial variability because we're dominated by local effects. The amplification or the multiplication factor in the Northern Hemisphere underneath the ice sheets is negligible. But in the far field distance from the ice sheets, you're getting a hundred times increase in this amplification factor. And when we move out to the end of the 21st century, under a high emission where you melt the ice sheets, virtually the whole planet has a significant, a catastrophic change in the extreme recurrence of flooding along our coastlines. So to conclude, the Earth Observatory of Singapore is working actively on a Southeast Asia sea level programme. This is a holistic programme. We aim to understand what is happening in the solid earth to do with groundwater withdrawal, to do with tectonics. We want to understand an array of local, global and regional processes in sea level. These will combine together with future projections of daily sea level and extreme events. It's a holistic program where we look at the impacts of coastal adaptation measures. The Earth Observatory of Singapore wants to work with our partners in Southeast Asia to provide projections of sea level at a local scale, at decadal timescales, to make the countries of Southeast Asia a safer and more sustainable place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Two takeaway points from your presentation. One, a tipping point in ice melting will accelerate sea level rise in the future. Second and more important point to me is that sea level rise is extremely site specific because of uh, crustal rebound and local compounding issues like uh, groundwater extraction. This tells us that there's all the more reason why we need to study sea level rise at the provincial or even municipal level in our country. So thanks for your presentation, Dr. Horton. Thank you. Moving on to our next presenter, she is the current director of UPMSI. She earned her doctorate degree in physical oceanography from the University of South Carolina. Doc Lau is also a member of the NPTE, uh, the Climate Change Commission. Some of her research interests focus on coastal ocean oceanography, remote sensing, ocean energy, coastal ecosystems, and climate change. May I now call on Dr. Laura David to give her presentation. Doc Lau. Good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Good morning, ma'am. 
Okay. Sorry. Let me start. Um, so we took a look at Sorry about that, <clears throat> technical difficulty. Let me start that again. Okay, we took a look at historical data, mostly coming from satellite images of temperature, sea level, and rainfall. changes uh, with respect to climate. As you can see in some areas like the Northwest Luzon, they will be experiencing a lot of changes, including extreme rainfall events, such as the one experienced during Andoy. In the Pacific side, almost the entire uh, Pacific side will be experiencing increasing very high increase in ocean temperature, equivalent to uh, more than that, more than twice the global average. But what is common in all of the typologies is the symbol of sea level rise. That means everything, uh, the entire Philippines will actually experience significant amounts of sea level rise, just as our previous speaker shared. Uh, accounting for about twice to even three times that of the global average. So what are the consequences? Yes. No, ka. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, you're back. Go ahead. Okay. So people will experience uh, increasing sea level rise, exposing more and more of their houses to uh, increase in erosion. The 2019 population showed the Philippines as having 108 uh, million people. And like Doc, uh, D.S. Ligarda said, 60% live along the coast. So this is about 64 million people. If only 1% of that actually lives right at the coastal area, we're already talking about 6 million people exposed directly to sea level rise. And according to this global estimate, the Philippines is colored red, which is about 1 to 9 million exposure of people living right at the coast. So this is about what we're estimating. Thus, uh, communities such as this, fisher communities where they live at very low-lying low islands will be at the highest risk. You know? So these types of communities will either disappear or as Congressman Chato uh, shared, they will have to adapt with houses on stilts and the like. What is equally uh, a problem with sea level rise is how Doc Lau, we can't hear you. Take a look at. Doc Sorry about that, everyone. I think we lost Doc Lau. Uh, Hi, I'm back. Do you oh, there, me? there. 
Oh, yeah. yes. Um, Go ahead. Perhaps Jane can share the screen instead so that only the audio will come through my internet. That's, that's a good idea. Jane, please share Doclaw's presentation and just move to uh, which slide, Doclaw? Slide number four. Right, slide number four. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So if you take a look at the blue line, that is the average sea level height at the moment. So all the propagules are above that average sea level height. They will experience inundation once in a while during high tide. But with just a few millimeters of sea level rise, that average height will increase. And therefore, what is now the place for uh, propagules to grow, especially that of Abyssinia and Sonorasha, the salt-loving ones, they will be the ones that are exposed. And studies have shown that exposure to higher salinity during the time of growth from propagule to seedlings would affect their survival rates, it would affect the cumulative shoot height, the mean growth rates, the mean total leaf area, and the mean dry weight. So that will be compromised. Equally, you will also compromise the species at the very back, which are only salt tolerant. They can survive uh, intermittent inundation. Uh, they will not die because of salt. But if they're constantly under a very saline environment, they will also die off. So you have your case of die off of the very back and slow die off of the very front because the new propagules will no longer um, survive. If there is no development at the back of this mangrove forest, then naturally all of these will just grow farther and farther away from the ocean and will survive as an entirety. But if there are buildings at the very back of the, this mangroves or houses or uh, roads, then that will prevent them from migrating naturally on higher ground and they will die off. The problem with that, next slide, please. Jane, can you give me the next slide, please? Okay. The problem is that is it has cascading hazards and cascading disasters. When high and struck in Palombon Eastern Samar, um, they face a storm surge up to 3.6 meters high. Their structures are only about two stories tall, and therefore they could easily have been wiped out. But if you see at the very top of this picture, um, there is a mangrove plantation located on an island a few hundred meters from the shore of where the town is, and it actually buffered the full impact of the waves. So according to the LGU, the mangrove saved them. Without these mangroves, if they die off, there will be increased exposure to storm surge of these types of communities. So it will increase exposure, that's a cascading hazard, and it will therefore expose the towns that are coastal, therefore creating cascading disasters. Next slide, please. Jay, next slide, please. Okay. Um, aside from this, mangroves are known to be good sediment traps. So especially the species of Avicenia marina and Sonorasha alba, they are known to hold sediments up to 10.5 kilogram per square meter per year in the intertidal zone and up to 39 kilogram per meter squared per year in the mid-tidal. So if these die off, all these sediments will actually be open for erosion and you will have increased sedimentation in the water column. Next slide, please. That coastal sedimentation will go into the near, nearby habitats, such as seagrass and coral reefs. At the very least, it will create murky waters or low light, decreasing the photosynthesis of the seagrass increasing the epiphyte densities, and eventually it can cause seagrass aggression. If the sedimentation is really high, then it will actually engulf corals, increasing their vulnerability to bleaching events, or eventually mortality if they're completely engulfed. Next slide, please. 
again, this creates cascading hazards. A cascading hazard is a sedimentation. No? So from a die-off of mangroves, you have a cascading hazard of sedimentation. And you end up with a cascading disaster of decrease in biodiversity and biomass of the fisheries associated with this habitat. So we know that um, studies have shown that if these three habitats are present in a certain site, you have very diverse and high biomass of fish. If only one of these disappear, then there's a drastic decrease in both biodiversity and biomass. So that's a cascading disaster for the environment. In addition, therefore, the problem is how this will affect our fishers. No? So about 1.6 million uh, there are about 1.6 million fishers in the Philippines. 27% of these belong to the municipal fishery or fishery which is associated directly with these habitats of coral, mangrove, and seagrass. So if these start dying off, we're talking about loss, not only of food availability for the entire Philippines, but uh, labor, loss of livelihood for our fishers. So if we combine the two, no, the the increase in sea level rise and the exposure to increase in sea level rise and therefore die off of all these habitats. We have these provinces, we analyze that these provinces are the ones that are at highest risk. So ARM, we have Sulu and Tawi-Tawi, we have Cotabato City in Region 12, Bulacan in Region 3, Bukal Cebu in Region 7, Eastern Samar in Region 8, Masbate Camarines Sur in Region 5, Negros Occidental and Iloilo in Region 6, Patangas, Quezon, and Cavite in 4A, Palawan in 4B, Zamboanga del Norte and Zamboanga del Sur in 9, and Pangasinan in 1. In addition, if you take a look at the where these fishers are, uh, sorry, can you go back one slide, please? In addition, if you take a look at this, uh, where the fishers live, these municipalities outlined on the very right side of the table show you where there's also significant inundation where you actually have to either really adapt on houses on stilts or take away the fishers from those areas. So they will be the hardest hit. Finally, there's a loop, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. If you start losing these mangroves and also the seagrass, you're talking about the release of already sequestered carbon in the amount of um, more than 1,500 tera carbon dioxide per hectare of loss. So imagine, not only will you have disasters, but you're actually going to perpetuate an even higher increase in temperature and therefore sea level rise. So that's it. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Doc Lau. Uh, what I appreciated in your presentation is that you highlighted the issue with sea level rise. Probably our problem, um, the least of our problems is the encroachment of the ocean uh, of the land. But what you're saying is that even a few millimeters of uh, sea level rise will affect biodiversity, uh, loss of our mangroves, which will compound our ability to be protected from storm surges and the like, increase in sedimentation, and so on and so forth. So this is how complex sea level rise is when we look at it as a problem of our coastal community. So thank you for that presentation. Moving on, our next presenter is Dr. Fernando Siringan. He is a professor and former director of the UPMSI. He is also an academician of the NAST and also a member of the NPTE. I should mention that Dr. Siringan was one of the first scientists to sound out the alarm for uh, ground subsidence, which uh, compounds a problem of sea level rise. Dr. Siringan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Magandang umaga. Good morning. Please. Sandali lang ah, i-share ko lang yung screen ko. Okay na ba? We don't see it. 
I don't see it. Okay, well, let me. Uh... Yeah, Okay. You see? All right. Um, yes. Now we can see. Okay. Go ahead. Doctor. All right. Uh, again, good morning. Magandang umaga sa lahat. Um, so I'll basically I'll be retracing uh, some of the points raised already uh, by uh, Ben Horton earlier. Well, let me start with uh, this diagram. Um, pinapakita nito ba ali, based on sea surface uh, uh, height measured from space uh, for the period 1993 to 2009. Uh, ito ba yung average na pagtaas ng dagat no, sa paligid ng Pilipinas. And you can see some numbers there. Uh, may number 7, may number 6, may number 8. Uh, those are average rates of sea level rise for the period 1993 to 2009. Overall, uh, sea level, wala pang ginagawa ang lupa dito, it's only uh, eustatic, uh, uh, moving. Roughly, it's about one centimeter per year. And a study by Wright, Brook, and others, uh, they were able to document the fastest uh, rate of sea level rise globally for the period 2002 to 2014 within the area of the Philippines, nanasa 1.4 centimeters per year. So tandaan natin yon, no? i-average na lang natin isang centimetro kada taon ang itinataas ng dagat sa iba't ibang bahagi ng Pilipinas. Now on top of that, gumagalaw ang lupa. So these are the, there are local factors, um, a lot of them, but for today, mag-concentrate lang tayo doon sa subsidence at saka sa tectonics. Okay? Uh, konti lang ang panahon, kaya mag-focus lang tayo doon. Um, ito yung tide gauge record. Um, this is from work from years ago, 2003. Uh, the upper panel is for Manila. The green line, that's uh, uh, average or uh, sea level annual, Okay, through time from before 1910 to uh, just after 1990. And you can see it rising rapidly after the 1960s. We've correlated that with the groundwater abstraction for Metro Manila at maganda yung fit niya. Kaya sinabi namin na itong nakikita natin dito na accelerated rise of sea level uh, is caused by uh, over extraction of groundwater. Now, uh, Ben pointed out Cebu earlier, so let's go to Cebu, which is this uh, figure right here. Uh, makikita nyo, through time, ang dagat ay bumababa. No? Meron siyang negative rate. Um, dahil sa yung lupa ay umaangat. No? Uh, tectonics ang dahilan dito. And then Holo is behaving in a similar way. Um, Dati ay umaangat and then very slow yung kanyang uh, yung sea level rise uh, after the uh, uh, the uh, after the 70s. Um, so Legaspi meron dito ng complication ng inflation deflation ng uh, Mayon volcano and Davao is a delta system so it's also experiencing uh, compaction of sediments underneath, so the area is also subsiding. Now let's look at Metro Manila. Um, etong mga uh, diamond shape na yan, those are benchmarks. And those benchmarks were occupied by Namria in 1978, and then they reoccupied uh, these benchmarks in 2000, and based on their own report, there is a change in the elevation of these benchmarks. The numbers uh, that you're seeing here are, it's in meters. So, ang pinaka malaking change dito ay ito, 1.46. All of those should be in the negative. Itong bahaging ito ng kalookan ay lumubog ng halos isat kalahating metro sa loob ng dalawang put dalawang taon. No? Um, bakit ba ito lumubog? No? Makikita natin 
yung matingkad na bato, that's adobe, that's volcanic material, which is uh, difficult to compress. And then the light yellow materials are uh, coastal deposits or alluvial deposits, which are readily compressible. And yet, if you look at the values of uh, uh, subsidence, they cut across the different types of, of lithologies. Ibig sabihin, hindi lithology ang control. Ang, ang control dito ay uh, groundwater withdrawal. No? Pero hindi ko na ipapakita uh, in the interest of time. So isang, for this, uh, if we look at the entire Philippines, ang dami-daming munisipyo na dependent sa groundwater. Pero if we over-extract yung groundwater, ang effect nun ay lulubog at lulubog ang lupa. Kaya siguro dapat na nating uh, i-move ang mga sarili natin na kung saan available ang surface water resource, itap natin siya for our domestic and industrial use. At sana ay maging isang policy ito ng Pilipinas. Ang paggamit ng groundwater ay hindi lang naman sa mga bahay. Ginagamit din ito sa mga palaisdaan. So this is uh, the delta plain north of Manila Bay. And that whole delta plain is populated by fish ponds that utilize uh, groundwater. Uh, the numbers that you're seeing there is the change in the height of the highest tide between 1991 to 2002. So we did... <clears throat> Uh, interviews all around this place and we ask for their observations on the change of the highest tides na walang ulan without rainfall. <clears throat> and in this area right here, uh, dito sa left side nyo, upper side, meron doon change ng one meter. Kamantala, bumabaka dito sa Orani, that's roughly almost a meter as well. So all over the delta plain, it's as if sea level is rising anywhere from 2 to 9 centimeters per year. Okay. Um, na kanina, si uh, uh, Congressman Chato, no, nung time na siya yung governor sa Buhol ay lumindol. No, October 15, 2013, magnitude 7.2 yung, yung lindol. At uh, itong litrato na to, this, is, uh, this was taken roughly around December. And you can see this brown area, Loon, Punta Cruz, and Maribohok. That's the uplifted reef. No? Inangat siya nung lindol. Nagkaroon ng co-seismic uplift. And the photo dito sa lower right-hand corner, that's sporitis. It's a coral that lives under water. Pero umangat yung lupa, kaya ayan, uh, hindi na siya makaligo. Eventually, namatay na siya. Um, we did some estimations of the magnitude of uplift and we were able to calculate um, anywhere from uh, roughly more than half meter to 1.57 meters of uplift. And for this area that was uplifted, that's roughly 548 hectares. Isang side ng, uh, ng bohol, no? so may umangat, pero meron ding lumubog. At nabanggit ni, uh, uh, ni Congressman Chato, Itong isla ng Batasan kanina, uh, ito ay isa sa mga isla na lumubog. Lumubog siya anywhere from almost a half meter, 0.43 to 0.76 meters. Uh, Bilang-bilangan, half meter, uh, Ubay, Pangapasan, Inanoran. And then within the mainland, Pook, Occidental, and Centro, Cebu, lahat din ay bumaba. But itong bagong banwa at uh, Mokabok, nagpunta rin kami dyan. Uh, walang indications na siya ay lumubog. Um, ito ang litrato sa uh, Ubay at 1.8 meter high tide. Ito yung bahay. Ayan na siya. Pwede nang lumangoy ang tao maski sa loob pa lang ng bahay. Pero katulad nga ng sabi ni Governor Chato kanina, ayaw lumisan ng mga tao. Gusto nilang manatili doon sa kanilang mga bahay. <clears throat> Let's look at the geological record, you know, patterns from the past. Uh, there are a lot of indicators that one can use to reconstruct paleo sea level. And we're, it is a good thing that in the Philippines, we have a lot of coral reefs and corals, you know, building the coral reefs. We can use them to reconstruct sea level. 
This is a photo taken from, uh, La, Un from La Union in Parwir. And you see this roundish things, okay? Those are micro atolls, and they live almost right at the, uh, uh, the mean sea level. But these micro atolls are about 1.4 to 1.5 thousand years. So, ibig sabihin ito, dati itong lugar na ito ay below sea level, pero ngayon ay above sea level na siya. And in the work done by uh, Mabel Abiganya, um, ito bale ay <clears throat> indicator na dating, ng dating paleo sea level na ang dagat was about 1.5 meters higher than present. Uh, this is from Kurimao, Ilocos uh, uh, Norte. Uh, isa itong bato na binuo ng skeletons ng mga coral. So through time, the corals uh, uh, secrete or produce coral skeletons and they get stacked one over the other and then tumitigasha, it gets lithified, it becomes rock. Um, we were able to walk the top of this uh, uh, rock formation, itong nakalagay na terrace, and we can see corals in living position and we were able to date them no, on, uh, around 7.6 to 6.5 thousand years ago. Itong features na ito ay very common all over the Philippines. Hindi lang ito sa Ilocos, makikita mo ito sa Palawan, makikita mo ito sa Mindanao, east side, uh, west side ng, uh, ng Luzon, makikita mo itong mga ito. Um, and then, um, isa pang <clears throat> indicator ng, ng PLC level are the marine notches. And this, this is a photo taken from <clears throat> uh, Palawan. Meron dito na sa pinakaibaba, makikita nyo may nakapasok, it's indented. There's a notch just underneath this uh, 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 outcropping shells of oysters. And then you see three more over here based on age dates. Itong lower three, those are all in the past 10,000 years. And the upper one right there is about 120,000 years old. Um, combining all the data sets that we have for the Philippines, mainly for uh, places like in Samar, Buyayawan, in Tenabonan, in Palawan, and in Parawir. Uh, dito bale sa diagram na ito, ito ay, this is sea level in meters, and this is time from 8,000 years ago to present. So moving towards the present, at about 7.5 thousand years ago, sea level became higher than present. Ito yung present sea level. It popped up and stood still for some time and then popped up again, stood still for some time. Um, this higher than present sea level within during this period, which we call the mid-Holocene, is consistent with the warmer temperatures of the period, yung tinatawag nilang Holocene thermal na optimum. But we see here, um, nagbabago-bago yung elevations no? uh, across the study sites, and we attribute that to tectonics. Uh, but if you look at the patterns, you see similar shifts timing-wise across the different tectonic regimes and we interpret that to be due to uh, use the sea. Sorry, Doc Ando, uh, you have 90 seconds left. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you can budget halos, your presentation. Yeah, halos huling, yeah, halos huling sl slide ko na to. Uh, right. July 23, 2020, lumabas ito. Ang sabi lang, Antarctic ice sheet can still collapse and add three meters more to sea level rise in the more immediate times. So this is not even the long, long period uh, uh, projected earlier by, by Ben. If you melt all of the ice masses in Antarctica, sea level can still go up by 30 meters. Now, so take away uh, for all of this, the static sea level rise will continue. We have local amplifiers of sea level rise. Um, uh, we have episodic large rises of sea level, which may still occur in the future, and therefore, it is essential that we know the directions, styles, and rates of vertical motions of our coast. We should minimize the local human-induced causes of sea level rise, and there is a need to shift the focus of development to higher grounds accompanied by continuing efforts to protect our coastlines. Maraming salamat. Gandang umaga.
Maraming salamat, Doc Ando. I hope we can share um, your slides to uh, our audience no, later on, if that's okay. Opo, pwede naman. Salamat. Moving on to our next presenter, he is the current Executive Director of Dost Pichard, a licensed geodetic engineer and professor of uh, the Department of Geodetic Engineering in UP Diliman. A couple of years ago, or maybe five years na siguro, he spearheaded uh, the Disaster Risk and Exposure Assessment for Mitigation, or the DREAM program. It's a, a big mapping program funded by the DOST. Please welcome Dr. Eric Paringit. Eric, are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry. Okay. Hi, hi, Dr. Eric. Please go ahead. <laughs> Morning to everyone. Yeah. So I'll not uh, waste my my uh, ten minutes. I'll just like to uh, share now the presentation. Uh, okay. Na nakikita na po ba natin? Yeah. So thank you very much to the organizers of this uh, forum for uh, the invitation. Uh, certainly, uh, there's a lot to be uh, talked about uh, sea level rise, and uh, and certainly there's uh, more that needs to be done uh, about it. So let me share to you what uh, what we uh, what I've come to know about uh, sea level rise in uh, a few years that I've worked on this subject. So these are this is just the outline of my talk. Uh, my wife is from Valenzuela City. And uh, through the years, nung nililigawan ko, pwede ko pa siyang uh, puntaan sa bahay nila. Ngayon, they've completely abandoned their uh, house because of the uh, challenges brought about by uh, coastal flooding in that uh, area. And these are just examples of how they, uh, these houses look like in that particular area. And uh, true enough, uh, how people uh, change the way now how they cope uh, and uh, one, uh, of course, uh, coping uh, mechanism is for them to abandon. And the same is true with other areas that we've uh, done the work. I, I, of course, I've worked with uh, Dr. Seringan for, for this part. No? Uh, and uh, this is kind of uh, memorable for me because it opened uh, up my eyes to the real, uh, no, the real challenges out there uh, when you deal with the subject of uh, sea level rise. And in some cases, uh, different people have different ways of uh, dealing with it. Uh, the more affluent ones uh, uh, easily adjust, no? But uh, sometimes you ask yourself how, uh, some, sometimes how adjustments could, uh, could also be uh, a little bit tricky, no? Even if you have the necessary resources. Uh, my, the topic aside to me was, uh, was on data availability and how will it affect the way how we study, the way how we analyze, and the way how we uh, move forward with our uh, uh, coping or uh, rising up to the challenges of uh, sea, level, sea level rise. But first, let me tell you something about how uh, we define sea level no? and before the rise is taken. So uh, all of us, when, you know, we're quite familiar with mean sea level. Pero uh, it all starts with uh, different uh, aspects that go with it. No? For example, we have to have a very uh, definite reference uh, plane for uh, defining it. Uh, we have to establish certain uh, standards and uh, uh, references no? By the, in the way how we uh, define them. Then all of the subsequent activities uh, will follow, such as uh, mapping of uh, topography. That is, of course, referred to some uh, reference. Uh, so, of course, the government is pouring in efforts to uh, to uh, no, no, to uh, establish and to maintain these geodetic networks. Now, in fact, uh, maybe in the last 10 years, this has uh, quite uh, been uh, given significant uh, attention. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, network of uh, stations have uh, all been used in some uh, work. No? Uh, so, we've seen some of the results actually go into scientific studies, but uh, mind you, the original purpose of these uh, uh, data sets that have been collected was uh, to support uh, the infrastructure work that's being done by government. Number two uh, was to also support the uh, uh, attaining no, some of the data that's needed to uh, support uh, construction and some other public, uh, public, public utilities work. And uh, 
this quite uh, extensive uh, analysis can be done uh, actually any anywhere. And uh, what's deplorable is that uh, aside from that uh, that uh, was shown by uh, Dr. Seringan, in some other uh, areas uh, there has been uh, a little attention on how uh, the data could be analyzed to uh, to a certain uh, levels of uh, rates of either uh, reduction or uh, increases in uh, sea levels. Ito, this is a recast of what Dr. Seringan had shown earlier. This is the original uh, graph uh, provided by uh, Namria, uh, but uh, this time it's being uh, shown uh, side to side in different ports. But uh, we see actually an increasing trend, and this trend is, of course, uh, more pronounced in the Manila Seaport. Uh, years before, uh, using a very coarse uh, data set, I uh, was uh, wanting to ask the question, who are most vulnerable? No? So if we have this total area of 298,000 square kilometers, and uh, we had uh, did a very simple analysis of just trying to determine who are the most uh, vulnerable in terms of the area and the number of population, these uh, the numbers that I, gave, that I came up with. And, uh, and arrived at uh, eight uh, cities in Metro Manila alone and uh, 854 others uh, that are directly uh, adjacent to the coastline. So this already translates to about 54% per, of the population. Uh, ito yung ginawa namin ni Dr. Sering a while back. Na, nakalkal ko pa kung uh, saan ko to kinuha. So we wanted to sort of confirm these uh, rates that, are, that were done in a previous study. Uh, by one of uh, uh, his colleagues. And uh, we were looking uh, directly at uh, uh, rates that are uh, found in uh, typical uh, uh, fisheries area, no? mga fish ponds, kung makikita nyo sa pattern nito mga to. No? And we did this, uh, I think, uh, three times. Unfortunately, dalawa na lang yung nakita kong data na available. But nonetheless, uh, we see really those uh, pronounced uh, differences in the course of uh, uh, a few years, no? And uh, just one year, ito pala, no? Itong difference ng blue at saka red, isang taon lang po ito. Uh, also, we have to be concerned about how we're going to uh, standardize um, elevation values uh, between islands. Kasi isa ito sa mga kailangan natin isettle before we could uh, uh, move forward with uh, how to uh, establish correctly the rates of uh, the, the rates of uh, increases in sea levels or correspondingly uh, reduction in the elevations of uh, objects above uh, sea level. Uh, of course, one very important uh, data that we need to consider is the availability of uh, topographic data. No? So once we have settled on the referenci referencing and through the years, uh, we have uh, uh, quite uh, collected a significant amount of uh, elevation data, no? and you actually see the here the the, the different sources as well as the coverage, uh, as well as the accuracy uh, imputed on them. So, ang uh, latest natin na medyo dalawang pwede nating mapagkunan ay yung sa IFSAR na, na kinuha ng na, namria at saka yung lidar, no? so. Uh, the LIDAR does not really cover the entire uh, Philippines, but nonetheless, uh, it gives a more accurate uh, result. Yung sa IPSAR naman, uh, ito yung rated na accuracy namin based on uh, the data sets that we have uh, so far collected. And you see here, kung meron tayong uh, uncertainty, to, uncertainty to about uh, 60 centimeters or one, 10 centimeters for these two sources, yun yung rate of uncertainty na yung i-attribute natin doon sa rates of uh, sea level rise. No? So kung if we simulate, uh, say for example, the increases in sea level uh, according to just these sources of uh, data sets, these are the corresponding rates. No? So kung, kung uh, 2 meter rise, say for example, and uh, maybe it, take, uh, it will take 100 years to do it, we, will ex we expect a 1%, no? so about uh, you know, 4% for an increase in 5 meters. Hindi naman siguro ito uh, mangyayari. No? Then, of course, uh, there's value in also uh, getting those uh, LiDAR data because uh, for the most parts, we were able to cover also uh, areas as well as those that are located in uh, big deltas. And uh, from here, you can actually discern the patterns of uh, the patterns of the, uh, uh, the, the, the hydrological makeup of the area. This uh, particular uh, slide here shows 
that uh, the elevation data that's uh, collected over Bohol, no? Nandito pala si Governor Chato kanina. Uh, and I, I think they already have a copy of this, uh, this very fantastic uh, data set, no? uh, which is available for the entire uh, province. Uh, the second to the last slide. Uh, marami pa tayong mga techniques na dapat pag-aralan na pwedeng we can use actually to refine the way how we study uh, sea level rise and its consequences to the uh, our coastal environment. Uh, uh, we need there are some refinements that need to be done in order to suit uh, uh, coastal environment, particularly for an archipelagic uh, area such as ours. But a combination of satellite altimeter, gravity satellite data, the use of uh, interferometric SAR and GNSS must be uh, pursued. Maybe at a continuing uh, level, in as much as the data is already uh, available and uh, they are also free no uh itong uh, three sources of satellite data halos uh, may libre ng uh, pwedeng pagkunan yan uh what we want to also highlight is the fact is, is the need for us to already uh while refining the sources of this uh, data sets we also need to look at our strategies already uh based on the information that's available to us and uh, this just illustrates uh those you know some of the measures that we can take either Accepting the fact that we are going to uh, to go down, protect them, relocate or uh, modify or adapt accordingly. Uh, in all of this, uh, we need to communicate to people. We, we need to make people understand uh, what this means for them. And uh, through probably some form of visualization and uh, communication, we will be able to uh, connect no? uh, with uh, people's uh, objectives, people's plight, and people's... Uh, uh, psyche no, on, uh, on this matter. Uh, actually, marami pa, marami pa akong nakikita ang kailangan nating uh, we need to work on. Uh, it's not just the availability of the data, but how, it, how it's going to be analyzed, how we're going to project uh, scenarios uh, in the near future, in the far future. And, uh, and, and in a lot of this, uh, we need the tools in order to uh, make this happen. Uh, overall, uh, I wanted to see how data sets could be used to actually create scenarios on impacts to certain uh, sectors or to certain uh, areas in the environment. For example, uh, ano bang maging effect ng salinity intrusion sa ating uh, groundwater resources, uh, coastal resources, and even sa coastal environment. So uh, really, there's a rich area of, uh, of, uh, of uh, science that we need to, that we need to do. And, uh, uh, with the availability of data and uh, and uh, support, no, uh, we will be able to uh, we hope we hope to be able to find some meaning and some uh, also people want answers on uh, certain things. They also are clamoring for some uh, solutions, uh, and uh, we need to help them find the uh, find this jointly. So with that, thank you again uh, very much for this invitation. Thank you, Doc Eric. The good news that uh, you mentioned is that there's actually existing data that we can use already. And it's just a matter of analyzing and interpreting this. By the way, uh, Eric and Doc Ando, there are questions for you in the chat box. So just please uh, go through the chat box and uh, answer them accordingly. Again, maraming salamat. On to our last presenter, Dr. Maria Loris Hamero is with the Manila Observatory. She graduated with a doctoral degree in sustainability science from the University of Tokyo. Dr. Loris is actually here with us today in the Zoom meeting, uh, but, but she's all the way uh, in Bohol right now. So to ensure an uninterrupted presentation due to potential connectivity issues, she already pre-recorded her presentation, which will be playing right now. Okay, Dr. Hamero. She can answer your questions, by the way, afterwards. Okay, let's play the presentation.
Okay, there seems to be no audio with the presentation. Ah, uh, there. There you go. Okay, so there's no audio, Dr. Hamero. Uh, can you test your mic if we can hear you? Uh, yes, hello. There, okay. Parang walang audio yung, hindi lumalabas yung audio. So okay, maybe, yeah. For island communities. There. Allow me to share with you the experiences of the small island communities in Tubigon, which is a municipality located in the northeastern side of Bohol. Specifically, I'm going to talk about four small islands, Bilang Bilangan, Pangapasan, Ubay, and Patasan. As you recall, in October 2013, there was a 7.2 magnitude earthquake in Bohol, which induced land subsidence in these islands. As a result, these islands now become flooded even during normal high tides, which they rarely experienced before the earthquake. Of course, this morning we are talking about climate-induced sea level rise, but what our research team did was to build an analogy using earthquake-induced land subsidence to better understand specifically the flooding impacts of climate-induced sea level rise, for which we currently lack case studies. So using this analogy, we tried to address the question, what are the social impacts of relative sea level rise? And from this point, I'm going to play a one-minute clip that we took on a flooding day in these islands. The small islands of Tubigon are very low-lying, with maximum elevation above water of only a little more than 2 meters. The communities are also impoverished, with many households living below the poverty line. The local highest high tide in the area is only 2 meters. However, in Pangapasan and Bilangbilangan, once the tide level reaches up to 1.8 meters, then the islands start to become flooded either partially or completely, depending on the local weather conditions. In 2016 alone, we counted a total number of 44 flooded days, with each event lasting up to 2.6 hours. During the king tide in June 2016, we measured a median flood height of about 20 centimeters. The situation is even more dire in Ubay and Batasan, wherein we counted a total number of 135 flooded days in 2016 and measured a median flood height of about 40 centimeters during the king tide in June. In terms of timing, tidal flooding typically occurs during spring tide across several days around the new and full moon of each month. The monsoons also affect the timing of flooding. During Habagat, Flooding happens in the daytime, directly affecting school children. And during Amihan, flooding happens in the nighttime, posing disaster risks to the communities as this coincides with the local typhoon season. As you have seen from the one minute clip, the island communities were severely affected by tidal flooding. But at the same time, life goes on in these islands. So now the question is, what are they doing about it? and how are island communities adapting to relative sea level rise. There are many adaptation strategies being implemented into Bigon Bohol, which can be classified into two, retreat and in situ. 
For the retreat strategies, of course, there was the option of permanent relocation to the mainland. However, there were several challenges to implementing this, such as the lack of funds, and at the same time, the reluctance of the communities themselves to move away from the island, given that their livelihood is mainly based on fishing. Interestingly, what they did instead was to modify their evacuation behavior. So before the earthquake, they rarely evacuated, thinking that only strong typhoons are destructive. But then after the earthquake, when they started to experience tidal flooding, they now readily evacuate to the mainland, thinking that a weak typhoon can also be destructive, especially when it happens during high tide. And this modified evacuation behavior has been very effective so far in protecting the lives of the islanders. In terms of in situ strategies, there are also several types. The first being community-based adaptation, which are strategies that are led by the communities themselves and sometimes supported by government and non-government agencies. There's also ecosystem-based adaptation, which for the case of the island communities are in the form of coral reefs as well as mangroves. Finally, there's coastal engineering, particularly sea walls, although when they are poorly designed, they could accelerate coastal erosion. Whenever island communities talk about adaptation, they often get asked, how long can you keep doing what you're doing now? What is the limit of adaptation? This is how many people typically understand adaptation. They think that after a certain tipping point, let's say one or two meters of sea level rise, then island communities will no longer have a choice but to retreat to the mainland. However, there are several challenges to this current understanding. First, the tipping point is usually expressed as an environmental factor, although we already know for a fact that people move away from their homes for many reasons, including social and economic. And at the same time, in this framing, retreat is often portrayed as a failure of in situ adaptation. There are many other potential limiting factors that are being hypothesized in existing literature to drive mass migration. These include the physical survival of the islands, tidal flood height and frequency, the cost of adaptation, and even extreme events. However, in the experience of the islands of Tubigon, these potential limiting factors determine the level of adaptation and not the limit itself. Instead, there are two potential limiting factors that may apply in the experience of the islands of Tubigon. And these are development problems and the future outlook of communities. In Tubigon, although the island communities already experience severe tidal flooding, they are still more concerned about poverty and the lack of livelihood options in the islands. And this can be problematic because development directly relates to adaptive capacity. And at the same time, how the islanders perceive their future on the islands could affect their decision to stay or to leave. But this is not so much about scaring the island communities until finally they decide to move. It's more about painting a more positive outlook for them on the mainland, which the municipal government is currently doing through providing scholarships to students until college and at the same time, ensuring that young islanders have skills that are employable in the mainland. So what are the key takeaways for us? First, we should stop thinking of adaptation as a matter of tipping points, but rather as a matter of choice. Island communities should be able to choose whether they want to adapt via in situ strategies or retreat strategies or a combination of both. But to be able to make this choice, they should have at least three of these things. First, sustainable development, which will help them build their adaptive capacity. They should also have full knowledge of their available adaptation options. And lastly, a proper understanding of the risks that they face in staying as well as in leaving the islands. We should also take control of the narrative and shift away from sinking islands to resilient islands. We should stop thinking of island communities as a basket case 
and force them to relocate when they aren't ready yet, and rather start to recognize how resilience has always been part of the island life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Your presentation and the, the outline that, that, that you presented will be very meaningful when we do our second webinar, which will be on action on sea level rise in September. Now, it's, uh, it, it's a fitting example uh, in the case of Tobigon to revisit uh, what they have experienced and apply that to other areas facing the same predicament. So thank you very much. You. Okay, I know everyone that we are past our you know, uh, end time, but we really wanted to get the reaction of stakeholders and experts as well in sea level rise. So may I invite our reactors first, Dr. Yulito Casas of uh, UP Visayas. He's an associate professor uh, in UP Tacloban. Um, he will be followed by attorney Alexandra Gamboa, who is with RARE, and he is the manager for government initiatives. And finally, uh, Dr. Bjorn Serborg of GIZ. Uh, we wanted to hear your, your thoughts about the presentation and if uh, there's some work that you have been doing uh, on your end. Uh, starting with Dr. Casas, please go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, and uh, congratulations to the Climate Change Commission for the success of this uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me as one of the reactors. Thank you. My warm greetings to all, especially to uh, Vice Chair uh, Guzman and our Deputy Speaker Loren Ligarda, who provided funding to our first climate proofing project in Tacloban Coast. Ma'am Loren, on the behalf of PH Science Advocacy Cooperative, thank you very much for your funding support. I fully agree to your sermon which I understand is a product of your passion no? and your uh, walk the talk policy. It is sad to note, however, that uh, this passion is not readily complemented no? by uh, concerned agencies. In general, I concur with the information provided by our distinguished expert speakers, indeed, Sea level rise is a slow motion emergency with potential cascading catastrophic impacts, specifically when combined with the strong typhoons and the rest of storm surge, which are touted as consequences of climate change. Sadly, our local leaders don't seem to learn from our overwhelming experience during the onslaught of Super Typhoon Haiyan in November 8, 2013. The coastal zones of Tacloban City that were considered as ground zero and was consequently affirmed as no belt zone are still presently densely populated. Uh, this is more than an information issue. The problem is actually you know, on the linkage. Uh, it can be linked uh, with the failure to implement the planned massive relocation of these coastal sites to identify the safer areas you know, we call as the Tacloban North. Probably a visualization map, you know, as mentioned by one of our speakers, uh, showing projected sea level rise in, in uh, cities, including Tacloban City, will help. Like uh, I once attended a lecture of Dr. Lori Tan of WWF in his presentation on lifeboat ethics and lifeline, building sustainability through climate adaptation, 
has shown the maps of airports in the Philippines and their possibility of being covered with seawater given the different scenarios and levels of sea level rise. It showed that with sea level rise, some major cities in the country will need to be relocated. Although these are just projections, but uh, affected LGUs can visualize and perhaps come to think of both proactive and reactive solutions to long-term solutions uh, given this uh, scenario. Uh, have we in the university considered syllable rise in our planning, decision-making and programming processes? Yes, indeed. UPV Tacloban College are now in the process of transferring our campus to a safer place in Tacloban North. The proposed campus is located further away from the shoreline. And since 2018, road network have been built, but still awaiting funding for the construction of our academic buildings. It will probably take longer time yet to really move the campus. Meanwhile, we're still subjected to climate change impacts as our present location is beside the coastline of the city of Tacloban, declared as no belt zone. So we are a case of a university campus located on a no belt zone area. So we really have to move you know, and transfer to safer ground. Dr. Casa, sorry to interrupt you. You have one minute yes. left. Okay. Thank you. Uh, syllable rise has to be linked with other risks like super typhoons and storm surge. As syllable rises, the li likelihood of storm surge is higher, surely higher than the storm surge that we experience in Tacloban City. And uh, decision makers you know, um, have to realize that climate change impact you know, is really real. I therefore challenge our policy and decision makers, development actors and LGUs to be more proactive rather than reactive a shared responsibility among different sectors is really a must, but sometimes government fails. So NGOs and civil society can take an active role to lead us no, through its advocacy programs to make uh, towards establishing resilient Philippine communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Casas, for your message. We'll move on to Attorney Gamboa. Attorney Gamboa, are you there? Yes. Hi, Doc CP. Good Hello. Afternoon. Okay, we can see you. Go ahead, please. Good morning, everyone. So you? congratulations to the organizers of this web webinar. It was very helpful to hear and be updated of, on the available data and the work that um, everyone is doing, especially our speakers, to quantify sea level rise in the country. So just a background. RARE is a non-government organization, an NGO, working with coastal communities and LGUs, um, specifically in coastal and fisheries resource management in municipal waters. So in our work, uh, we always see and we realize the need of communities and local government units or LGUs to make science-based decision-making. So, and with this, and with the relatively new compounding threat of climate change, there is quite a need um, to cascade existing climate information, such as those that we saw today, as well as conduct uh, more localized uh, CCVA or climate change vulnerability assessments in the country. We also see that there is uh, it's very important to reach more LGUs, and that uh, as that is a lot of work, of course, because of the vast number of coastal communities we have being an archipelago, and as we saw in one of the presentations uh, we have today as well. So a lot of our partners still have not accessed actually the information they need on sea level rise and other climate change effects to be able to make these science-based decisions. But as to the appreciation naman of uh, the effects, especially um, sea level rise, as Congress Manchato mentioned early, earlier, there is a high awareness naman already of these effects because they experience it firsthand by coastal communities especially. 
Now, yung need na lang and yung challenge is to provide, uh, especially the LGUs, access to this data and the availability as well of localized data especially so that um, they can take that data once they've understand it properly and they can input it into their planning process so they are better prepared to cope with the effects of climate change. At present naman, we um, at FAIR have included sea level changes as part of our planning decision making and even we have taken it um, to a, a more programmatic approach where we are already conducting our own CCBA at our partner communities and LGUs as part of our Fish Forever program. The CCBA specifically is for coastal communities lang in the fishery sector with the goal of feeding the analysis that we get from that study into their coastal and fisheries resource management through the LGU officials. So we have also been partnering, of course, with the Climate Change Commission and its national panel of technical experts to identify policy gaps in the sector that we could, um, what we need more to support the sector, especially in terms of climate change um, planning and programming, as well as uh, we are working towards making these types of climate information available and accessible for the LGUs in our country, who we really do believe are the frontliners of this fight, of this fight especially when we think about sea level rise, that it really uh, the first people to feel it will be our coastal LGUs. So um, right now, as mentioned, sea level rise and other climate change eff effects are already felt immensely by our coastal communities. Uh, I guess yung challenge or yung issue in that may arise uh, when we prepare for sea level rise is that um, the cliche holds true that the clock is ticking. And at this point, it's ticking quite fast. Uh, we've seen through all the projections that our um, speakers have been showing us that uh, we are already there at the point where we're feeling these kinds of effects. So our work as civil society, as well as um, government or academe and all the other um, stakeholders feels like we are running a race and we are running against getting to the point of no return. So knowing that um, feeling, that makes it feel like it is an immense challenge. And I believe that we can only address this challenge if we act now and if we act swiftly. And echoing Congresswoman Legarda, that we make this one of our utmost priorities amongst the many other challenges that our government and our country is already facing right now. Thank you. That's all, Paul. Thank you, Attorney Gamboa. Thank, and thank you for highlighting that the battle is actually already happening on the ground and that uh, we, we actually don't have time you know, to waste because the problems are already being felt by, by our communities. Thank you for that. Last but not least, we have Dr. Bjorn Serborg. Bjorn, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Hi. So my this, uh, my video switching on as well. Okay. By the way, Dr. Serborg is the principal advisor and cluster coordinator on climate change of the GIZ, one of the longtime partners of the CCC and many of the other organizations in this forum today. Go ahead, Bjorn. All right. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. C.P. DeWitt, um, and thank you very much to the co-organizers, the, the Oscar M. Lopez Center and the Climate Change Commission, for having me here and inviting me to to kind of react to um, to these five presentations um, preceded by the the opening remarks from um, Honorable um, Edgar Chato and, and Deputy Speaker Speaker Lauren Legada. So, um, thank you very much for all the input. Um, let me try to kind of weave together a little bit these five um, presentations that we've seen. I think what we've seen is um, a very nice progression from a high level, um, almost global scale with example, uh, kind of um, analysis of the, the um, hydrology um, of sea level rise and then more and more kind of to the local level and, and the effect on the people in the Philippines. So what impressed me the most or what, what I really took away from the presentation from, from Dr. Horton was that um, was magnitude and time frame. The magnitude is, 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 is immense. I mean, we, I think many of us can't even quite imagine yet um, what, what it would mean if the, the, uh, the ice sheet on Antarctica or even Greenland, which is considerably smaller, will melt. The other thing is the time frame. 
Um, up until 1950, we will already see significant change. But um, beyond that, I mean, the curve is in most places going straight up, um, and this will mean a, a level of adaptation that, that will be very difficult uh, to achieve. And, and if we want to adapt to that, we, we better start uh, doing so now. Um, and it also showed very clearly, I think, that we need to be prepared for both slow onset events as well as catastrophic events. Um, Going one step further, the presentation from, from Dr. David, Laura David, um, kind of showed showed nicely how the uh, how mangroves um, and, and the local ecosystems and marine ecosystems react or may react um, to sea level rise and what adaptive capacity nature actually has if if we let them. So I think the concept of ecosystem-based adaptation, which wasn't explicitly mentioned here, but I think that really needs to be brought into um, into connection what we have seen in the presentation from Dr. David. Uh, the mangroves being able to retreat if we let them. So there's implications on the local zoning bylaws and the point that I will make again later is uh, the information for people, planners um, at the local level is highly, highly important. Um, if we move on to, to Dr. Fernando Siringan, um, I think what was impressive here is uh, the role of, of groundwater withdrawal. Um, and the, what really stuck in my mind well, there was the example of the fish ponds um, and uh, the, the aquaculture, which is, of course, a great economic activity and provides benefits to the people there. But we need to balance uh, the, the impact between this economic activity and, and the, the groundwater withdrawal, especially in light of sea level rise. So the two together are very, um, are a, 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 a threatening uh, a combination, um, combination really. So I think uh, here again we have the, the combination between human activity, knowledge, and understanding, and how our actions on the ground uh, really affects um, uh, uh, affects the impact of, of sea level rise. Um, coming to the fourth presentation, um, Dr. Paringit, um, I think um, sort of almost made the point perfectly to his predecessor by showing the pictures of the houses uh, from, from his family in, in Valenzuela um, and, and what has happened here. Um, so a similar point being made, um, but then as he progressed through the presentation, I think we have seen um, uh, other opportunities he has pointed out there. And that is the, the availability of uh, topographic data, uh, of geodetic data, uh, an understanding of really kind of how does our land and, and, and the, the sea base, um, what does it look like, how does it work, um, what uh, can we do to adapt to it. Um, and then one thing that really kind of came to my mind immediately there is the role of the newly established agency, the Philippine Space Agency, um, which will be able to provide us with, uh, with satellite data in addition to, to the other um, satellite data that are already available. So there's, an, I think there's an opportunity to be taken um, in, in the work of the Climate Change Commission, uh, the UP, the Oscar Lopez Center, and, and Pagasa, and all the other uh, institutions that are, um, that are involved here. Um, all of this, all of these four presentations already kind of got clearly into the direction which shows that adaptation always has to be um, very local, and it's a very local process. It's the people who kind of do little things to adapt, putting their houses on stilts and so on, um, <clears throat> which um, which are measures. Um, on a larger scale, of course, like looking at ecosystem-based adaptation, um, land protection, parks protection, and so on, are equally important, um, important measures. Just a moment. Um, so again, it's people, planners, local governments that, that need to be informed here. Um, but the presentation from, from Dr. Luis uh, Gemero, I, I hope I pronounce this correctly now, um, I think has given, made a wonderful point on how adaptive people actually are already and how people on the Little Island communities manage uh, to observe what is going on on the ground and, and take little steps and bigger steps um, all at the same time. Uh, we have seen the evacuation behavior, uh, making people safer, even if it's not convenient. Um, we've seen the example of putting uh, houses on stilts um, as one point, uh, one kind of adaptation measure. Interesting to, to observe quite certainly also the role of migration, um, staying or leaving a place 
not just a tipping point, but a multitude of uh, factors that would people uh, decide to, to migrate or not, and which can be seen as an adaptation strategy as well. So to summarize this, I think that a couple lessons learned, um, we need to be prepared for both slow onset and catastrophic events. I think the Philippines has made great progress in, in disaster risk management and preparedness. Um, we also need to look more and more into salination, ag agriculture, aquaculture effects, and so on, in terms of slow onset events. The other one is adaptation is local, and we need to get this knowledge and understanding of what is going on uh, to the local level. And here, I think um, one important point is projections. Um, look forward, what will this mean? So that we don't always have to be reactive in our adaptation, but we can plan ahead on a 10-year scenario, on a 30-year scenario, on a 2100, 80-year scenario from here on. I think that is something very, very important. Um, we are uh, in the process of establishing a South-South Center for Climate Information Services within the Climate Change Commission. Um, it's, it's in food preparation, but the South, South Center works together with the Climate Vulnerable Forum, a forum of 48 member states, um, and it would be a, um, a, a very good venue to share events, and, and we will put uh, quite a bit of uh, emphasis on, on projections, of climatic projections, so that this layer of the knowledge uh, aspect can be, can be brought into the Philippines and the, the other members of the CBF. All of this is, of course, needless to say that we need to hold the international community to account. Um, greenhouse gas mitigation um, is still absolutely necessary. If we want to be anywhere near uh, the 1.5 degree goal, we have to stop using up our carbon budget uh, from here on. Um, but I think these presentations have really kind of quite nicely shown um, what options we ha have in kind of climate change adaptation and what can can be done about it. I'll leave it with this. Um, at this point, I'll hand back to Dr. C.P. DeWitt. Thanks, Bjorn, and thank you for stressing that it will take a concerted effort from government, local government, the scientists, development organizations, uh, private sector, the academe, in order for us to implement um, uh, adaptation to sea level rise. The only good news I can I guess provide is that we now have a network uh, with our speakers and reactors as well as uh, experts in our audience. We have friends from PAGASA and the different uh, branches of government as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep this as a network uh, moving forward when we do our next webinar on actions uh, towards sea level rise adaptation as well as other uh, policy recommendations. So thank you for, for, for sharing uh, your thoughts, Bjorn. Thank you. At this too. point, thank you. thank you for all those who uh, stuck with us. I know we are 35 minutes beyond schedule. Um, we cannot end this without closing remarks from Secretary Manny de Guzman. He pre-recorded this message, so please watch this. Good morning. First of all, congratulations to our national panel of technical experts and the OML Center for organizing this event. On behalf of the Climate Change Commission, I'd like to thank our esteemed speakers and subject matter experts, Climate Action Champion, Deputy Speaker Lauren Ligarda, Congressman Edgar Chato, Dr. Benjamin Horton, Dr. Laura David, Dr. Fernando Sirigan, Dr. Enrico Paningit, Dr. Loris Hamero, Dr. Yulito Casas, Attorney Alex Gamboa, Dr. Bjorn Suberg, Dr. Rodel Lasco, and Dr. Carlos David. You've all eloquently explained why we should be concerned with the changing climate and the rising sea levels, and why we should act urgently as a people. I wish to thank also all the participants from the national agencies and local governments, the academia, the international organizations, and the civil society. Thank you for joining us. You've heard it from the experts. Rising sea levels pose enormous threat to lives and livelihoods of our people 
and the future viability of our economy. This is why the Climate Change Commission pursues more research on sea level rise and its likely impacts in the country and mainstreams climate science in development policies, plans, and actions. This work yields more meaningful and acceptable results when done in collaboration with all of you, with the agencies and the institutions you represent. Today's forum is one important step toward a broader cooperation across sectors on dealing with the increasing threat of rising sea levels to our communities. Rest assured that the Climate Change Commission shall continue to advance research on the slow onset impacts of climate change in the country. We shall also hold more online learning exchanges such as the Experts Forum that inform and explain climate science to the public. Last but not least, we shall continue to deliver capacity development services to our local governments and to help them access available domestic and international climate finance for adaptation projects. Overall, in advancing research, in learning from our experts, and in helping our community survive and thrive, sustained by your support, we could all look forward to a safer and more secure future for the Filipino people. Thank you and mabuhay. Thank you for that message, Sekumani. Okay, so we come to the end of our first webinar. I hope I see everyone again uh, in our part two of uh, this series on sea level rise. But before we end, um, in behalf of Dr. Rodel Lasco, our forum today would not have been made possible without those working in the background. So I'd like to thank personally uh, the OML staff, Jane, Kato, Perpi, Alfie, and the whole technical team at OML, as well as Jill, Sir Ludwig, and Jerome of the CCC. Hope to see you again in our next webinar. We will keep you posted as to sharing uh, information from this first webinar, as well as the schedule for the next one. Maraming salamat po. Thank you.